China is really going big uh, in the global fintech arena. And so um, on one hand, you know, the U.S. can talk about I'm going to ban TikTok from the U.S. market. But on the other hand, the, this whole company is entering into the global fintech empire. So how do you stop it from rising? Surely it's such a pleasure having you with us today. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Dean. Let me, let me kick off. Let's talk a bit more about the US-China trade war that is going on, has intensified over the last few months. Um, obviously, especially coming from a business school, I think all of us, or most of us at least, would agree that uh, trade protectionism is not really that productive. Um, I was wondering, however, are there any benefits to the trade deal from uh, China's or from China's perspective? Trade imbalance, by and large, that's the simplest part of this uh, whole U.S.-China uh, trade conflicts. And so on top of that, you know, a lot of the comprehensive issues as the U.S. has been proposing in terms of uh, industrial subsidies, industrial policies, and uh, state capitalism model within China that were supposedly also a part of this uh, U.S.-China comprehensive trade deal. They were essentially left out of uh, the phase one negotiation to phase two. Too. The competition is always a good thing. And so I think uh, concurrently, we started to see uh, Chinese asset management firms starting from CICC to CITIX, etc. These counterparts are starting to innovate and they're starting to uh, prepare themselves for this uh, imminent, uh, bigger uh, level of uh, uh, competition in the financial markets. And I think uh, China is coming to this phase where inevitably China is going to have to uh, further liberalize the financial market and uh, further uh, 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 propel this uh, uh, financial market reforms. And so I think with the foreign uh, competitive forces coming in, it's going to help to expedite the financial liberalization process in China. So that is a good thing. And the second thing, like agriculture, it's really in China's strategic interest to purchase more U.S. agricultural goods, and not only uh, for consumption, you know, because of uh, simply market pricing mechanisms, but also to build up the strategic reserves, because it's always important for China as a major national security to build up the strategic food reserves. And the third thing I should say more fundamentally is actually this uh, trade deal to uh, enable China to buy more products from the United States voluntarily or involuntarily, I think more involuntarily, but it's helping China to really build itself, to upgrade itself from the world's factory to the world's market, because China has always called for this economic model upgrade from a export-driven economy, and by and large for the past two decades or so to an investment-led economy. And so investment-led economic growth model works for quite a long time, and I don't think it's efficient anymore, trying to continue to borrow money to finance essentially expansion as a main engine of its economic growth. And so China would inevitably have to upgrade itself to a consumer-led economic growth model. In 2019, consumption has already taken up uh, over 54%, so over half of China's GDP. So China is somewhere on its way there. And I think with the U.S.-China phase one trade deal, it really it starts to force China to move even quicker into turning into the world's uh, consumer market. And I should add, uh, Martin, uh, China currently has 400 million middle income class. And in 15 years' time, it's projected to grow to 800 million. Just think about the consumption, the power of consumption with 800 million middle class on the horizon in about 15 years or so. So we, we spoke a little bit about trade, and, and, and clearly the tension has been boiling for a couple of months. But when we look back over the last few weeks, really what has taken center stage is really tech, right? Or technology competition to some extent. Um, uh, just recently, the US has restricted market access for Huawei or TikTok or even WeChat. Um, are we going into a global tech decoupled world? Well, Yes, well, Martin, we are all have uh, been watching very closely about this potential tech competition. Uh, essentially, as a fundamental core component of U.S.-China economic competition, going full on, isn't it? Uh, I think starting from Huawei, really, it's a rather interesting story if we look at it, um, perhaps beyond the current uh, global 
uh, context to, to look at it from a longer historical time span. Because uh, by and large for millennia, well, Spain at one point in time was a major global power, but even before that, for across millennia, it was the global economic income divergence and essentially the economic takeoff has only happened over the past 300 years or so. More fundamentally starting from the Industrial Revolution. And that's essentially what Kuznet said, that understanding about the rich countries and poor countries in the long span of global history is essentially a very recent phenomenon. Because if we look at the chart of uh, global, say, per capita income empiricals, the past 300 years, we started to see the North Atlantic region taking off against the rest of the world uh, in a very diverging way. But uh, before that, across uh, two, three millennia, the per capita income for a lot of the ancient civilizations, all the same, there were not a lot of differences. And so that we started to understand uh, the fundamental power of technology was essentially the North Atlantic countries became not only the owners of uh, global cutting edge technology, but they have become the early adopters of uh, global technology. And that's essentially the fundamental impetus of economic takeoff against the late movers in global technology. And I think that's the reason why Huawei is so fundamental. And I think it's so challenging in a way is that in global history, for the very first time, a global cutting edge technology is for the first time being owned by an emerging economy with Huawei's rise and again by the early adaptation of uh, a cutting edge technology across the developing world now. So I think it's going to tilt the, the economic narrative between the developed world and the developing world and maybe the developing world with the early mover advantage of global technology is going to narrow down that income divergence for the first time and maybe even surpassing the developed world for the very first time. And coming to um, TikTok and WeChat, these are really uh, some of uh, the, uh, the best uh, Chinese uh, technological companies on the horizon. But I doubt how effective fundamentally it's going to be because as we saw that with the executive order in about 10 days or so, in theory, both TikTok and uh, WeChat will be banned in the U.S. market. But at the same time, we saw that uh, Tencent, after the executive order was announced, one of the companies that is backed called KE Holdings, it became the sixth largest the Chinese companies in terms of market cap that are listed in the United States. And currently, the market cap for KE Holdings is somewhere at par with uh, China's search engine Baidu. That just shows the power of China's economic and technological engine and how well it's perceived by the global capital market and the investment community. One way is to ban Chinese rising technology companies out of the marketplace, but to what extent can you eliminate it completely? And the TikTok is another interesting story. This company not only has managed to secure two very interesting consortium of uh, very large bidders from U.S. state companies, starting from our go to Microsoft and Walmart entering the race, but TikTok at the same time has just, uh, you know, in Chinese media, it's uh, just announced that it's uh, secured a third-party payment processing license. And that license in particular means that ByteDance now is going to enter the global fintech race. China is really going big uh, in the global fintech arena. And so um, on one hand, you know, the U.S. can talk about I'm going to ban TikTok from the U.S. market. But on the other hand, uh, this whole company is entering into the global fintech empire. So how do you stop it from rising? So, so really, I think your answer sparks so many additional questions. So um, let, let's, let, let's maybe focus on Huawei for, for, for a second, a little bit longer. Um, because we spoke primarily the relationship between US and China and obviously the role of technology or companies like Huawei. But clearly Huawei has uh, sparked discussions and debate, not only in the US, but also as well in, in Europe. So what makes this company so crucial to the global technology debate today and particularly for Europe? Mm. Europe is very interesting because ironically and coincidentally, it is being pushed to the global uh, front line of this uh, techno geopolitical debate, I should say. And it really fundamentally means a lot for Europe's future. I think this Eurasian integration has in a way been the long theme 
of our history. This Eurasian continent uh, integration has always, in a way, that ambition has always been there and being played out by various players and uh, in various different forms. And of course, in this modern age, uh, I think China, there is no parallel to what China is trying to uh, build with Eurasian connectivity to the pre-modern era, but uh, China does want to connect Eurasia into a one connected framework with its infrastructure. And I think those infrastructures are fundamentally underpinned in two uh, core technologies that China is able to offer today. One is the telecom infrastructure that is essentially led by Huawei, and that is to connect the telecommunications network uh, on the uh, infrastructure level with, with the Eurasia, but also with China and the uh, ASEAN countries under its Belt and Road Initiative. And the other core technology is uh, China's digital finance capabilities, starting from what we just talked a little bit earlier with China's intake companies from Alipay to WeChat Pay, etc., but more fundamentally to China's imminent launch of its uh, sovereign digital currency. And I think with the sovereign digital currency, the ambition is obviously for China to connect a multilateral currency framework to essentially enable the use of technology to enable the currency, the Chinese RMB to become a global currency for trade settlement, for investment, and uh, maybe even for land of last resort. And so I think uh, the telecom infrastructure and the fintech infrastructure are essentially the two pillars that China can use uh, in the economic way to try to pull this uh, Eurasian economy closer together. The Huawei is obviously on the top, top of uh, the negotiations agenda. So if we look at uh, not only the entirety of Europe, but let's just look at the G7 and the NATO member countries. Uh, France has not banned Huawei. Uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel is quite receptive to Huawei. Italy has not banned Huawei. Even uh, where we are, Spain, Spain has accepted uh, Huawei. A uh, Turkey NATO member country has adopted Huawei. So it's really a mixed bag. I think this is interesting because the U.S. Uh, is going to try, I believe, to have Europe along with it to build this what's called the clean network. But at the same time, I think in this liberal global order, it's uh, increasingly starting to fade away and leave room for every country essentially to start to plan for what's best for their country. Uh, when it comes to the Huawei story, obviously that leaves a lot of room for uh, European powers to choose. And I think China and the U.S. are both obviously trying to convince the countries in their own direction. And I think Europe will uh, continue to be this global fault line in a way uh, when it comes to uh, China and the U.S. Uh, technological parallel. So it's certainly going to be exciting for us in Europe over the next years. Um, Shelley, you mentioned a little bit before as well that we have recently seen a couple of high-profile IPOs, um, actually of Chinese companies in the U.S. And um, while at the same time we see that the U.S. is threatening essentially with systematically delisting Chinese companies. Mm. Um, the U.S. has spoken as well um, about potential financial sanctions against Hong Kong, but at the same time, the Hong Kong capital market is as vibrant as ever or more vibrant than ever before. China has launched a series of intensive financial liberalization policies and so forth and so forth. So which global markets do you feel will stand to benefit from these changes in policy? Well, this year we have seen uh, a vibrant market of uh, Chinese companies uh, seeking listings in the United States. Despite all the talks about the systemic delisting possibly by 2021, uh, based on basically the uh, audit records requirement. And so under current uh, US and China securities law, it is true, it is practically very difficult for Chinese companies that are listed in the United States to be able to reveal three consecutive years of audit records uh, to the U.S. regulators. And so China did say, I must say though, Martin, that, uh, that uh, China's uh, top regulators have come out and said we are willing to work with the United States. And the good thing is that there is still about a 15-month uh, window there to see uh, if the 
two sides can come to a solution. But let's say uh, there are uh, policies. I think the direction is that uh, the U.S. is going to further restrict the uh, Chinese uh, uh, companies uh, in seeking capital market access in the United States. And so um, with that, that hasn't dampened the Chinese entrepreneur's ambition to uh, be listed in the world's uh, deepest financial market to seek global capital. I'll, I'll raise one particular sector. Uh, it is China's NEB sector. We know that it is a Chinese national strategy now, to, especially post the COVID-19, to invest massively into a new uh, electric vehicles sector. So the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, that's the governing ministry, that says uh, and plans for by 2025, 25% of China as new car sales will be in new electric vehicles in just about five years' time. And currently, it's only roughly about 3% of China's uh, new car sales. And so let's imagine the speed of growth there. And so um, when China has a, a national strategy on something, we know that usually it gets it does get uh, executed. It gets done. <laughs> <laughs> it gets done. And so I should say, ironically, all three of the largest the private EV uh, companies in China are currently all listed in the United States. So it is fundamentally the U.S.-led institutional capital and the global capital, obviously, that finances this major EV rise in China. And so the three companies are NIO, uh, Xpeng, and the Li Auto. And so they are Tencent backs, Alibaba backs, and Chinese Meituan backs. That's one particular sector that we saw that it was on one hand, U.S. has made in China 2025 is a threat to us, but this is uh, essentially the epiphany of China's made in China 2025 in high end manufacturing. And uh, the market uh, perceives it very positively. And the other thing I should say is that Hong Kong market itself has, uh, it, because of its proximity to Chinese market, it's always easier for Chinese, uh, the best of Chinese companies to see listing in a place where it is closer to its home turf. And so we started to see uh, the biggest IPO in a long time, Ant Group, that is the fintech arm of Alibaba. So of course, if I were the, if I have capital today, I would be thinking, okay, the most serious market, probably China, the market that probably has the highest growth potential, China again. So uh, we started to see a lot of capital coming from the dollar capital uh, coming through the RQFII program uh, into China's onshore market to invest in Chinese companies. But uh, more conveniently, a lot of uh, dollar capital starts to invest in Chinese companies in Hong Kong. And I think all these trends will continue. But at the same time, I should also add that China has instigated a number of uh, very important uh, financial market reforms domestically. One is that uh, China has just launched uh, two, three weeks ago this uh, IP uh, registration-based IPO system uh, in Shenzhen. And so that's going to essentially uh, enable IPO listings uh, much faster and also allow a lot of technological companies to not to have all those stringent requirements of profit. So essentially that turns a portion of the Chinese capital market to become more Nasdaq style to essentially fuel uh, China's uh, technological growth. And so a lot of things are happening within that greater China region and the capital market. But I say on a periphery level, if the US-China capital market decoupling escalates further, then I think Singapore and also uh, even London stands to benefit as well from this uh, whole global capital market uh, recalibration. So I, I think in uh, this interview, we have to talk a little bit about COVID-19 as well and, and what might be the implications. So I, I think COVID-19 clearly have, has fueled, um, I think, the level of digital transformation across the board, um, but also in, in China, whether we talk about health screening apps to online education or the nationwide rollout of the 5G network. Um, could you give us a little bit of view on how you see how COVID-19 has changed the Chinese economy? Martin, it'll be fundamental. Post the COVID-19, uh, the reason China has recovered uh, uh, very quickly, we started to see a 3.2% GDP growth in Q2 of 2020. 
uh, that was fundamental if you look at the subsectors of uh, what essentially has pushed China's uh, economic rebound. That was essentially infrastructure investments, fixed asset investments. And so post the COVID-19, very quickly, China has launched uh, what's called the new a digital infrastructure investment plan. China has always resorted to infrastructure investment by and large for the past two decades or so. This is nothing new, but this time is different because it has a digital twist. And so China has come out and uh, made a plan so far, I think about $5 trillion have been earmarked, $5 trillion with a T have been earmarks for uh, new digital infrastructure investments over the next five years. And so that's going to be specifically investments in uh, uh, smart cities, cloud computing, 5G networks, and IoT's uh, Internet of Things. And so all of those investments will give China a fundamental edge, I think, coming into the current decade in driving what it aims for exactly uh, in uh, taking a global technological leadership in the technology space of the 21st century. And if we look at uh, the 5G space, it's rather interesting. Uh, Chinese uh, ministry has confirmed that, that there are currently over 60 million 5G users in China already. And by 2025, the plan is to have 460 million 5G users in China in just five years' time. And so talking about uh, 460 million 5G users marching in China. Even we put everybody from the United States on 5G networks, it, it wouldn't be that sort of numbers. That is fundamental, the early mover advantage. China has a demographic advantage. And on top of that, I should say, China has a data advantage. Uh, one of uh, China's leading economists, the Zhu Min, who was also the former deputy managing director of the IMF, uh, he became one of these nine leading economists that were invited to share ideas with Chinese President Xi Jinping recently. So I thought his ideas would uh, indeed matter to the world. And he said, uh, for Chinese uh, government, we hope in 10 years' time, China will own twice as much data as that of uh, the OECD member countries combined. So essentially by 2030, China is going to have twice as much as the entirety of the data possessed by OECD country. That is astronomical. And so now it's rather interesting that Chinese advantage has become this uh, marriage of uh, the telecom infrastructure advantage with the data advantage. Just once the infrastructure is there, then China can uh, use the infrastructure to generate quite a lot of data that are useful for AI development, for Internet of Things. And uh, more fundamentally, these data can be seen as significant as land, capital, labor, all the 20th century factors of productions, but the data is going to perhaps be even more significant in the digital age in generating digital outputs. And so this marriage of telecom and data, I think it's going to fundamentally give China a real economic push, driving even closer of this economic parity between China and the United States. Shirley, I wanted to come back um, a bit to a point that you made about the recovery in China, right? I mean, like essentially what you're saying is, China was able to recover uh, in a V shape. So really talking about the speed of recovery, right? And um, when we look at 2020, it seems that uh, China has projected to grow by 2% while looking at the US and the EU, uh, most likely they're going to contract at an economic level. So how strong would you say and how sustainable is China's economic recovery? Mm -hmm. Martin, uh, if, if we look at Q2, of course, uh, very soon, hopefully, uh, we're going to see Q3 coming out. So in Q2, uh, China's economic recovery was very KNG, I should say. So China has uh, resorted back to <laughs> very KNG style uh, in tackling uh, aggregate demand shortage. And so the government has come in, uh, pushed for investment, particularly in fixed asset investments, in infrastructures and the real estate developments and so forth. And so all these sectors have recovered to positive territory in Q2, but we haven't seen a very robust recovery in the consumer space. We just talked about China is aiming to fundamentally change the economy to service-led uh, economic growth model. And so the recovery of consumption is, uh, is significant. So I cannot say that China uh, has fully recovered until the services sector in the consumption area has fully recovered. And, but that 
again, it's complicated because on one hand, it's based on consumer confidence. If you want the Chinese to start to consume more, first of all, they have to make more. So I think it's important for per capita income to continue to rise. On the other hand, uh, Chinese will consume more once the uh, employment becomes more stable, and so that means we need to create uh, China needs to create more job opportunities. And post the COVID nineteen, unemployment rate has gone higher, and uh, China is not denying that issue. But I think it's really really important for China to uh, find ways to stimulate employment and job opportunities, and that again investments uh, by the government may. Just offer that temporary cushion to uh, have uh, more employment opportunities created, and so th these are the fundamental factors that can more structurally enable Chinese to spend more. But also, I don't see China can fundamentally recover on a standalone basis unless the rest of the world recovers with it. And so we saw that a lot of the trade-led companies in China are suffering a lot today because not only the supply chain has been disrupted between China and the world. But also, the rest of the world hasn't really fully recovered economically, and so where does the demand come from? And so China has uh, started many different reform agendas in the consumer space uh, in the past uh, couple months to essentially enable these uh, export-driven companies to start to sell their products that were meant to be produced for the global markets to be sold within China. China has also started the uh, Hainan Island new policy back in July that essentially enables Hainan. Island to become the largest free trade port in China, and then enable duty free shopping within Chinese territory. Not only Hainan, but there are policies that are currently on the horizon to establish duty free shopping areas within the inner cities in China to enable Chinese to start shop uh, shopping more within. China itself, and so uh, a number of policies that essentially will help to promote the healthy recovery of the consumer space. But as far as we saw from a statistical level, uh, consumption hasn't fully recovered yet. But before we spoke a little bit about uh, fintech as well, and um, looking at a more national level, it seems China wants to create its own digital currency. So what do you think is the plan or the ambition behind this? Why is China doing that? Martin, a lot of people say, well, China did this uh, because of Libra. <laughs> it was because uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, uh, testified in Congress and said, well, you know, uh, we, we have to have our currency because China is on it. Well, I should say that uh, from uh, China's uh, PBOC, the central bank, uh, this uh, digital currency has been in the works since 2014-ish. And so it's been a long time coming. It's just in the place where it's uh, sort of ready. And so let me give you a uh, update. So currently uh, the digital currency is being test piloted across essentially all major economic areas in China. The phase one testing started sometime in May of this year in uh, four cities, uh, in four Chinese cities, and that essentially tests the uh, efficiency of the transactions uh, via apps and so forth. And so it seems like everything is going smoothly. And I should say it's rather interesting uh, when it was first tested with these four Chinese cities, McDonald's, Starbucks, Subways, all these American franchises, they were one of the first to uh, tender China's digital currency on this app. And uh, now the plan is to extend uh, the test pilot. It's still not formally launched, but it's going to go into the uh, Shanghai, into River Delta area, Beijing, Tianjin, uh, Hebei area, and uh, the greater Bay area, and also some central economically affluent regions in China. And so there is a clear timetable, but it looks like it's getting more ready to be launched. And in terms of the infrastructure uh, within this uh, sovereign digital currency thinking, the structure is uh, essentially two layered. And so for the central bank, uh, there is a wholesale layer. The central bank is going to push this digital currency to eight wholesale banks within China, including Alipay and WeChat Pay. And then uh, there is the retail layer to allow the eight commercial outlets to distribute it further to the retail lanes. And so in phase one in the currency launch, so it's going to be primarily used within the Chinese domestic financial circulation, and it aims only to replace M0, 
So just the cash within the system. And so essentially, we could see it is nothing more than just to use the digital currency, a bunch of uh, codes and barcodes, etc., on the phone to replace the physical RMB in the system. But the ambition, obviously, is for this digital currency to be wider used and adopted within a larger global multilateral framework. Because we know that China's、uh, capital account is not fully convertible, and so China has always had this、uh, concern about capital account convertibility in the sense that if there were you know financial crisis situation as we saw in Asian financial crisis 20 years ago, so in case of another situation just like that, then with a sudden capital flight. That could pose systemic shocks to the Chinese financial system. The concern has always been there, and so that's why、uh, China has been quite careful about reforming the capital accounts and convertibility space. But with the digital currency, one advantage it allows is the full trackability and traceability of、uh, capital flows on this、uh, digital network. And so now it would enable, ideally, in the next phases, for China to open up the capital accounts. Because it's able to track illegal capital outflows or inflows, and essentially to be able to track where the money is going, and if it's illegal, you know, there's money laundering activities, etc. The central bank would be able to monitor it instantaneously. And so, with that concern being eliminated, then I think a Chinese RMB is really on its ascent. So it kind of essentially a long belt and road initiative regions, and so now we're talking about 130 countries globally, but more fundamentally. Across Eurasia or Asia Pacific, and so about seventy countries or so. This、uh, trading integration is going to essentially propel the RMB to be wider used as trade settlement currency. Perhaps for our China to use RMB, the digital RMB, to、uh, to be wider adopted in、uh, investment base across the region, and also perhaps even for the RMB to become a, a regional reserve currency, and、uh, all the possibilities、uh, that arises on top of that. In a way, this is the contingency plan for China, essentially to establish a, a regional multilateral framework where Chinese RMB could freely transact and freely flow on the digital network that is away from the U.S. dollar clearance system. Surely, I think today we covered a lot of ground. I know we could continue for hours, but、um, unfortunately, we have come to an end. Thank you so much for your amazing insights into not only China but really into the world.、Um, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean, and、uh, best of luck with、uh, the IE School and for the fall. And also,、uh, congratulations to your students globally、um, to become a member of the IE Business School. What an honor! Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley.